Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's give Jesus praise for His Word this morning. And he's the living Word. He's the bread of life. And we've been going through on a journey through the book of James. And as we've tracked along, we found out that the BOJ is a book on wisdom. A book, a big buffet on wisdom for life. How many of you like buffets? Yes. All you can eat buffet. Some of you are like looking at me, what's all this about food? We're going to have even more food as we go along, you'll see. Well, the book of James helps us with wisdom on li in life, and, and it's very relevant to today. And James helps us with certain information and clearing up some things and matters in this life. Um, and I'm very expecting that God will speak to us here this morning as we continue this journey. But before I give you a bit of a recap, let's pray over the Word this morning. And Heavenly Father, just celebrate you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this privilege. We thank you for our pastors, Apostle Theo, Dr. Bev, and thank you for blessing them with rest. And Father, we just submit to you. Let your word go forth with power this morning and going into our hearts, bringing faith. Faith rises. All doubt and fear goes. And thank you for bringing clarity, wisdom, guidance, and direction, and that our thoughts and goals and desires in this life come in line with your plan and purpose for our lives. Holy Spirit, you are the author and the teacher, and we submit to you in every way. Nothing of any human being or any created being, but only from the Spirit of God we receive. In Jesus' name, and all those in agreement said, Amen. Amen. Those of you who joined us online, we're so glad you invited us into your space. And wherever you might be, focus this morning, because God has surely got a word for you. And if you like something, just tell us about it. It'll be great to hear from you. So, if we recap, remember in February, we did four parts on the book of James. And essentially the first one I think we, we did was faith and, no, no, today we're doing faith and works, right? Faith and works, right? So what we did go through was prayer of faith. Prayer of faith, knowing that the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. Then we looked at trials and temptations. And trials, something we go through that God is with us, He'll take us through. But temptations provide an opportunity for choice. Do I give in to the temptation or do I trust God and move in an, another direction? Then we spoke about the power of together. And we discovered that God hates division. But He loves and celebrates diversity. I mean, just look around you. Every one of us looks different. And God loves us. He loves diversity. He's a multi-sensory, multicolor God. He's a creator of all things. And one of is just not good enough for Him. He loves diversity. Amen? Amen? Then also, wisdom from above was the other one. That God gives us wisdom freely. Gives, freely, gives wisdom freely to whoever asks Him. But when we ask, we must believe that He gives us. Amen? But the overarching theme in my estimation of the book of James is that if we don't quit, we win. Say that if I don't quit, I win. I mean, we've read the end of the book, we win, right? So let's just keep on keeping on. But how do we keep on keeping on? Well, this is where James comes in. So this morning, we're going to kick off this portion and we'll finish it over the next few weeks is faith and works. And we're going to be looking at chapter 2 from verse 14, and there are notes available. If you don't have a hard copy, you can grab one at the door, or just go on the uh, web page, you can download it, it's there, it's available, hard copy and soft copy. So here, faith versus deeds. What is this about? I guess we could also title it Yes and Yes, and you'll understand by the end of the service, uh, the message why I would say yes and yes, but faith and works, faith and deeds. Now, before we get into it, I'd like you just to greet someone next to him and say the following to him. Say, God is speaking to you. Okay, now that you turn to the one you wanted to reprimand, turn to the other one and say, he has an eternal plan for you. Now, talking about eternity, some of you are looking at me like, oh, what's the catch? Talking about eternity, this man was standing before God and conversing with God, and he said, God, I'm trying to understand eternity. How much is a million years to you, God? So God thinks, he says, well, a million years is like a day. It's just like a day to me. Oh, all right. He says, okay, so how much is a million dollars to you, God? A million dollars? Well, that's kind of like a penny to me. I guess it's like a penny. So the man thinks about it, he says, hmm. 
may I have one of your pennies, God? So God says, sure, just a minute. Okay. <laughs> All right. So anyway, let's get into it today. Thank you for catching it right there. Man. That's a Facebook moment there, right? <laughs> faith and works. Now, when it comes to faith and works and living by faith, we certainly have an authority in the House of Apostles here, Dr. Bev. I, I've known them for over 40 years, walked with them. And to me, there's, I don't know personally anyone who talks faith, walks faith, lives faith more than they do. And he's an authority on the subject. His books are rich. They're easy to understand, uncomplicated. And I encourage you to get them. And let's feed our faith because by faith we overcome in this world. Amen. So I'd like to read this portion of Scripture, and I'm going to kind of read the whole, most of it continually because it brings clarity. It's really a discussion. Imagine being in a courtroom and being, having a, uh, putting forward a case and then a rebuttal, and this is kind of what he goes through because there were people that were a little bit divided on the subject. And, I, you know, we want something here that's going to enthuse us, help our faith, because I believe we want a living faith. A faith that I can get my teeth into today. I don't want something that's pie in the sky, right? I want something that I can go home with and, and apply today. Can I have an amen? amen. It's going to answer, well, there are going to be some questions. There are going to be various vantage points. We look at it this morning and full of good quality examples. So let's kick off with verse 14 in James chapter 2. Faith without good deeds is dead. That's the subject. So he says, what good is it? Can you imagine in a courtroom? What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or a sister who has food, who has no food or clothing, and you say, Goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? Now I'm so glad that we're not part of a do-nothing church. We're part of a church that does something, right? Come on now. <laughs> Verse 17. So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now someone may argue, some people have faith. Right? Some have faith. And others have good deeds. Now this is dividing between people. They're separating it. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith and you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Right? This is the group that said we have faith but not, we're not interested in works. He says, you say you have faith? Well, good for you. You believe there's one God? Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Faith without corresponding actions is useless. Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was born, excuse me, don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions work together. Say that Abraham's faith and actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete by what he did, and so it happened. Just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. Now how cool is that? Hi, I'm Redick. I'm a friend of God, FYI. I mean, if you put that on your Instagram, you'll get a couple of hits on that, right? Friend of God. He's a friend of God. So you see... We are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Not by faith alone. But now let's have a look at what James is going to throw right here into the mix. And it's fascinating. 
sometimes we kind of tend to read over it and think, okay, but there's significance to this example. He's just spoken about Abraham. Now he goes, verse 25, he says, Rahab the prostitute is another example. Hold up. How do you bring Rahab the prostitute into the same conversation as Father Abraham? Father Abraham had many sons. You know, I mean, that Father Abraham, I mean, he's a hero. Rahab the prostitute? How are you going to put them together? Abraham is the father of faith. Abraham is a friend of God. Think about it. Abraham is the father of covenant. And Rahab is a harlot. She's a prostitute. You're going to put them in the same conversation? How do you do this? Comparing the two and to think that they are similar? How in the world does God do that? Simply because God sees everybody through grace. Thank God for that, right? It's an amazing thing that Rahab is in the Old Testament. In Joshua chapter 2, you know, Rahab, she's useful to the spies when the Israelites want to conquer Jericho, that fortified city. And she hides the spies. And when she discovers who they are, and she says, oh, your God is the true living God. She has a revelation of God. And they say to her, you know what, Rahab? Just tie a red scarlet rope around the window. And whoever's in your home, when we come and the city is destroyed, you and your family, whoever's in that home, will be saved. Doesn't that make you think of the time when they took the lamb blood and put it on the door frames, right? And the death angel passed in the, in, when they were still in Egypt. More importantly, does not make you think of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. That when we go through the cross, we are saved from our past and eternal damnation, right? It's amazing that Rahab the prostitute had this revelation while she was still going through some things. God will meet you right there where you're at. He doesn't expect you to climb any kind of ladder, any kind of holy mountain before He'll interact with you. As a matter of fact, He likes to meet you right there at your lowest point in life. And Rahab is spared when they destroy the city the spies, you know, they're told, do all of that, and we see that she's spared. Now, she has this particular label on her, Rahab the prostitute. And I don't think we should worry about the labels that people put on us. But sometimes they do sting a little, right? Don't worry about how people tagged and what they call you and etc. As a matter of fact, don't worry about your past or your yesterday as long as we can just learn from it. Because God is bigger than all of that. I mean, look here. Rahab, the prostitute, the prostitute. God brings her from the Old Testament into the New Testament. How does He do that? Right in Matthew, she's in the genealogy of Jesus, one of Jesus' descendants, bloodline. She shows up in Hebrews chapter 11 in the Hall of Faith. She's ins inscribed in the pages of the Bible forever. She's still called Rahab the prostitute. I think God could have just said Rahab. But He wanted to make sure that we understood which Rahab this is. Rahab the prostitute. Now here in the book of James, we see that she is still called that. And I think the reason God continues to put it in there is because He wants us to understand that He is definitely bigger than our past. So that God is bigger than my past. And I believe that's a word for us here today also, that no matter what's gone on in our past, that we need to be a person of faith. No matter what's happened in our past, we need to be a person of grace. That God's grace is sufficient for us in all things. No matter what people say about you, God can use that. No matter what label they hang on you, God can use that in a great way. But let's not remain in our past. Amen? We can't drive forward looking in the rearview mirror. It's impossible. So let's continue in verse 25. Remember we said Rahab the prostitute is another example. And she, Rahab, was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. Say that. As my body is dead without breath, so faith without good works, is also dead. Hmm. Faith without deeds is dead. 
Yes, faith. Yes, works. That's what God is saying. Yes to both. It's an amazing passage of Scripture, and I've been reading it over and over and over in the book of James just this week a number of times, and I love it. And, you know, here um, there are other Scriptures that also confirm faith and works and, and talk about that, and I'd like to dive into two of them now just to bring a bit of support and some clarity on what James is saying here. And the first one we're going to go to is, J is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. And here Paul the Apostle is writing. So we heard James's account. Now Paul the Apostle writes in Ephesians 2 verse 8, and he says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. Say that, I'm saved through faith. Saved through faith. Hmm. He says, this is not from yourselves, right? It's not anything we do. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. What? Hold on now. Someone might say, wait a minute. Like my mother-in-law says, wait a minute. You know, she's Portuguese. Wait a minute. Paul and James disagree right here in the Scriptures. No, no, they're not disagreeing at all, not at all. In the same way, they're saying the same thing. It's just being revealed slightly differently. Verse 10, he says, For we are God's handiwork, or His masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So Paul is saying here, you are God's masterpiece, and you have been saved not by works, but you're saved for a work. Say that. I'm God's masterpiece. And I'm saved for a work. We're not saved by the things we do, but we are saved to do things. We have a mission, a unique assignment due to you. God wants you to find fulfillment in what He created you for. If you say, well, I'm not quite sure what God wants me to do. Well, let us try and help you at least get on the growth track journey and help discover what God put inside of you. But take that first step. God can certainly steer a moving vessel rather than one that's anchored in the harbor. James and Paul have total agreement on this. As a matter of fact, Paul comes back later on in his letters and he wrote to Titus 3 verse 8 and he says, This is a trustworthy saying. And I want to stress these things, it's very important, so that those who have trusted in God, those who have faith, may be careful to devote themselves to doing we deeds, works, doing that which is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Say that faith and works is excellent and profitable for me. So James and Paul, they're both experienced grace. James, the half-brother of Jesus, right? He experienced saving grace in a different way to the way Paul experienced it. Remember Paul, on a, he was persecuting, killing Christians, and then Jesus appears to him. Paul, why are you persecuting me? I mean, the way they both experience the saving grace is very different, and that's the same thing with us here. Some of us might experience in our teen years, some earlier on in life, some later on in life. The way we experience grace and our experience with Jesus could be under differing circumstances and in different ways. But one thing that remains constant is that we all experience grace that points us to life in faith. We all experience grace that points us to a living faith, an active faith. Not just a faith that talks, but a faith that walks. Can I have an Amen. Not just a faith that is spiritual, and being spiritual is good, but a faith that is just spiritual. No, we want a faith that is spiritual and can also serve and make a difference. James is working with us throughout this passage of Scripture. I mean, just think about it. The book of Acts of the Apostles was written because the, ap the Apostles were busy with Acts. Right? It's amazing. You know, there are times that I read the Bible, but it's often the Bible is reading me. There are times that I'm uh, searching the Scriptures, but it's mostly the Scriptures that are searching me. And this particular passage in the book of James has certainly been searching me quite a bit. And this passage in James is one of those that I've learned so much about. And here's an amazing thing, is that James and Paul and all these apostles in the early church are dealing with people who are taking sides. 
Remember they said, well, I'm of faith and I'm of works. They were dividing. They were taking sides. And this is a letter, if you remember chapter 1, verse 1, where James writes to a scattered church, a divided church, a church that was scattered geographically and physically, but also scattered through persecution and spiritual pressure. And now there was division in the doctrine that was coming in. So he's bringing all of this division and trying to bring it all back together. And he's saying, stop picking sides. Christians, stop picking sides. It's not always either or. Different views, dealing with right or wrong, who's spiritual and who's not spiritual. James is saying this debate of you've got faith and I've got works, these are disagreements. But here's what James knows. He knows that if the body of Christ, the church, say me, the family of Jesus, right, that's us, that if we are deluded and divided, and if the family of God become polarized, then the enemy is going to win. And then all these hurting, lost people out there won't hear about the saving grace of Jesus because we are His hands and feet and His mouthpiece. So the enemy from day one has tried to polarize and divide the church, but he may not in Jesus' name. Amen? From day one, he's been trying to get people, Christians, to pick sides, either or, when Jesus is yes and yes. I mean, right throughout the New Testament, we can read faith and deeds, spiritual verse serving, prayer versus practical, worship and Worship versus works. Conviction versus compassion. Belief versus behavior. All these things. You know, I'm in the behavior camp. Well, I'm in the faith camp. Well, I just want to let you know, I'm in the Jesus camp. How about you? Right? And Jesus is about faith and works. Hallelujah. The Jesus camp is yes, faith. Yes, works. Yes, deeds. Yes, worship. Yes, holiness. Yes, helping others. It's yes and yes. I'm telling you, it's harder to be that. It's easy to choose sides. But it's easy to do it God's way when we allow the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us. Amen? Now you might just think, oh, Jesus is all about yes, 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 yes. He can also give a distinct and hard no to many things. There are things that Jesus gives a hard no to, things that He warns us about, things that are not good for us things that we should not be involved in or partaking of. He says no to. He doesn't want us to go in a direction that brings destruction and ruin in our lives. Amen? God gives a hard no to things that are divisive in the body. Big things like, I'm a Democrat. Well, I'm a Republican. What about race? Blah, blah, blah. What about gender? Blah, blah, blah. I'm Pepsi guy. I'm a Pepsi guy. Well, I'm a Coke guy. Back up. I had to lighten it a bit, right? Dr. Pepper. Well, oh, never mind. Okay. It's okay. I think we can all just get along. Amen. The oil of the Holy Spirit helps us not to rub each other up the wrong way. We all find sides that we can divide ourselves on. But Jesus is saying, no, no, no. It's faith and it's deeds. It's worship and it's works. See, I got saved in my teen years. And when I got saved, I got saved. I did do a bunch of silly things along the way. But when I knew, I had a heart change. Prayed, and it's God walked into the room. I just knew He was there. And when I got saved, I got saved at the age of 15. Anyway, with school and later on got involved with the youth. And during a school break, I thought college break, I can't remember which one it was. I went to the youth pastor. And his name is Paul Siebert. And I said, Pastor Paul, please give me something to do. So he looked at me and said, like what? What do you want to do? I said, anything. Just give me something to do. So he said, sure. And then we started with little tasks. And one thing became another thing. Before he knew it, it was snowballing. I was carrying chairs in and out of venue, cleaning, sweeping, cleaning out the yard, mowing the lawn, cutting trees, trimming back trees. Genuine. And if I think back a few weeks ago, nothing has changed much in 40 years, right? <laughs> Setting up furniture, doing all sorts of things. As a matter of fact, I was so busy, there was no more time for sinning. Then there were prayer meetings on Saturday mornings and witnessing and doing all these things, church to attend. No more time for other things. And all the time, Apostle Theo kept teaching us on faith, on holiness, on faithfulness, on God's stewardship, 
tithing, giving, serving, and witnessing. I mean, there was no more time left for other things. And in the midst of all of this, he said, Brother Radek, you need to go to Bible college. Yes, sir. Bible college was five nights a week, Monday through Friday, three and a half hours per night. And then on Friday after Bible college, still went to youth. And we carried on. You know, young people, the clock knows no end. Saturday morning, prayer meeting. We did it. Saturday night, fishes of men out outreach in the city center. Gangsters, thugs, all of that kind of stuff. I mean, it was hair-raising, exciting, but God was there. People were being saved. And then Sunday morning, there's no time to sleep in church Sunday morning. Sunday evening, church. Start at 7 o'clock with no ending time. Monday morning, start the whole thing all over again. Why am I sharing this with you? Now you might say, well, which one was better? The Bible college, the witnessing, the worshiping, the church service, the giving, all the spiritual things. Was that better? Or working in the garden, setting out the chairs, cutting the trees, picking up the litter. Which is better? Faith and deeds. Yes and yes. Yes, I was studying. Yes, I was witnessing. Yes, I was setting out chairs. Yes, I was worshiping. Yes, I was giving. Yes, I was serving. It was yes and yes. A living faith. Praise God. See, my belief moved me into action, into my behavior. When I look back, I could see how my faith was growing. It was overflowing into action in my early teens and early 20s. I learned that faith and deeds are not opposite. Faith and deeds are inseparable. Say that. Faith and deeds are inseparable. Martin Luther said, it is impossible to separate or take sides on faith or works. It is as trying to separate a burning flame from its brightness. It can't be done. Now I remember when I was working in industry, some colleagues inviting me out afterwards for some after work activities. You know what I mean? And I mean, I wasn't a party poop or anything, but I was doing things and I said, well, I can't come and explain to them all the things that I have and Bible college and all that. And they said, oh, you're, you're a do-gooder. I'm not sure what they were thinking inside, but outside they were telling me, they were like, oh, you're a do-gooder. I thought, do-gooder? Oh, that didn't kind of made me feel about this big, you know. I felt like this label, do-gooder, it's not a complimentary one. A do-gooder. And I kind of went before the Lord and I said, Lord, I mean, I don't want to be known as a do-gooder. I mean, I'm living out my faith, but here I'm a do-gooder. I mean, it just didn't ring well. And then God said to me, says, you know, I've called all people to work in various ways. I've wired them differently. I've wired people to reach others in various ways, different circumstances. He says, but I'm the bread of life. And all you have to do is just give me to the people. And I thought about that. He says, don't be concerned about what they call you. He says, they called me worse names. Okay, so do good is not too bad. All right. He says, but then he reminded me of John 6.35. He said, I am the bread of life, the living bread. And you know what I realized is that a living bread can reveal itself any way it chooses to, to whoever. Living bread can reveal itself as a croissant <laughs> or as a breadstick. Maybe even a ciabatta. Or how about a biscuit, right? And to some of us locals or local people here, maybe a tortilla. Do I get that? He said, I can reveal myself any way I want to. He's the bread of life. He said, just, you just keep doing what you're doing and distribute the bread of life. Trust me, act on the word and distribute the bread of life. Family, we are not to give ourselves to people. You do that, you'll be picked dry in a moment. We are to give Jesus to the people. He is the bread of life. Amen. And that changed everything for me, right? Being both spiritual, faithful, and also practical. It's spiritual, it's faith, but it's also serving. Now here at church, we push spiritual growth. We definitely need to grow spiritually. We push faith. We focus on God, the importance of the Word, the importance of educating yourself. I mean, God says study to show yourself approved unto God. He checks how we invest in ourselves. I never thought about that, right? 
We think, you know, education, when I'm a Christian, all about it is just getting to heaven. No, no, no. The reason you got saved here is because there's a lot to do before you go there. This is like a job interview for eternity. And in the job interview, you put your best foot forward and you dress your best and you do your best. I just thought I'd throw that out there. Right? We've heard that. But I encourage you, get on Bible college. Get on the foundational training. Invest in yourself. It's not time spent. It's time invested. The entry of the Word creates Christ inside of you. All right, let me get on some. Bible college didn't pay me to say that, but it's a good thing. 21 days of prayer is something we invest in, right? We pass out groceries also, and we feed the homeless. We serve in small groups. We serve in the, on the dream team. But while we're busy here, let's not forget the neighbor that's just gone through surgery. Let's not take our eyes off our neighborhood because there are needs all around us. It's faith and deeds. It's yes and yes. And that's the heart of God. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. Faith and deeds. The love of God is demonstrative. It demonstrates. So James is saying it's not either or, but it's faith and deeds. It's impossible to have a solid faith without a solid work or deed of expression. Let me say that. It's impossible to have a solid faith without a solid work or deed of expressing that faith. You might think, I'm strong, I'm spiritual, but if you're not walking it out in every area of your life, you need to have a checkup of your heart. Let God guide you and direct you. But He expects us to make a difference wherever we go. Because people today need a living faith. Just think of all the fear and the hurt and the anguish and the trauma and disappointment that surrounds us. They want a living faith. They don't want a religion. They want a living faith, a living Savior, someone who can make a difference in their lives. So how do I walk out this living faith? Well, let me just give you maybe three applications. It's easy. I can handle three. I'm sure most of us can handle three, right? The first one is a living faith with words. A living faith with words. What does that mean? Well, this is important. We don't need to be secret service believers. Right? No, no, no. We need to tell our story. There's no undercover Christians in God's family. We need to tell our story, right? How do we do that? Well, tell people how you got healed. Tell people how God healed your marriage. How He helped you overcome and recover from a trauma. How He forgave your sin. That's a big one. How He helped you through different things and aspects in your life. How He was there for you when you needed Him. Just tell your story. Be a witness for the Lord. Amen? It's a living faith with words. People need to hear it. So let's not be afraid to tell our story. It is your story. You know it's true. So even if they don't believe you, you still know it's the truth. Who more authoritative about your story than you? You're the most believable person you know. Just tell people what Jesus did for you. The second one is a living faith with works. Works. How important is that to you? It's important that you and I do something with what God has done for us. We offer up our life. You might be feeling that maybe you want to do something with your life. And I know that many of us here make a difference for the Lord. But maybe somebody has recently joined or you're watching online and you're thinking, whoa, this is something new to me. Um, and you've been prompted to do something. Come, let's help you. Go Get on growth track. You know, we don't grow in a spiritual way so that our spirituality impresses people. And I'm not saying it's anybody's motive, but sometimes we just want to grow spiritually and we think we're doing God a favor. And I'm exaggerating for effect here. But a spirituality that impresses but doesn't influence a broken, hurting world is no good. So let's use our spirituality to improve our world through serving our community. Let's get involved. You don't have to do a lot. It only takes small hinges to swing big doors. Just small things, a collection of small things make a big difference, right? So faith, a living faith with words, a living faith with works, and a living faith that worships. How about saying, God, here's my life. Take it. Do something good with it. 
Here are the days I'm like Abraham, but also here are the days I'm like Rahab the prostitute. Here's my yesterdays, but here's my todays, and here are my tomorrows. I worship you. I surrender to you. God already knows everything. Can't hide anything from him. Let's deal with our yesterdays so we can have profitable, beneficial tomorrows. Amen? Amen. Let's be intentional. You know, Say, God, take my words. Take my work. Let it be a work for Jesus. Let me just get involved. Take my heart, my skill, my efforts. I just want to worship you with it. Let it be a, some, a testimony to what you have done. Because he is most worthy of worship. So as we come to a close, I'd like to read out of Matthew chapter 5. And it's amazing that right in the beginning of the New Testament, the words of the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 5. If you can have some keys, thank you. In verse 14 he says, You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. Now think about who's speaking here. In your Bible, are the letters in red? Well, then it's the master. We need to salute and say, yes, Lord. Right? You are the light of the world, a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Yes, faith. Yes, deeds. Yes, let's give Jesus praise. Because our good deeds that are done in the unction of the Holy Spirit and through our faith bring praise and honor and glory to God Almighty. Isn't our heart's desire to please Him? Absolutely. Let your good deeds, your good works, the things you do, the things you offer, let them shine out and testify to God's faithfulness, to His goodness. Because of our faith in God, because of His Word in us, demonstrated by corresponding actions, our good deeds, because of our, my serving, I can tell you the world will notice. The world will notice. You do your bit, and let God put a magnifying glass on your life. Because visible faith brings glory to God, but it brings comfort to a lost and dying world. And you know, there's nobody like our Lord Jesus that does that. He will use the least, Rahab the prostitute. He will use the hurting. He'll use the lonely. He'll use those with the past, and he'll use those with success in life. Wherever you might be, there's nobody like our Lord Jesus that does that. He can testify through you, through your works, through your words, and through your actions, and through the things that we do in and around. Isn't that wonderful? Now, if you are here and you're saying, I, want to, I just want to celebrate God, let's close our eyes, family. Let's just worship him for a moment. Let's close your eyes and raise your hands if you're saying, God, this is me. You've put a living faith inside of me, but I want to walk out this faith. I thank you that it's faith and it's good deeds. It's yes and it's yes. Yes, faith. Yes, worship. Yes, works. Yes, it's spiritual. Let's raise our hands in worship and just love on Him. Father, we thank You that You've appointed us, You've anointed us, You've called us to serve You, to make a difference in this life for Jesus. It's not about us, Lord, but it's about us shining Your life, Your mercy, Your grace, giving You to the people, Lord. Oh, Father, I pray that we might just see what Jesus saw while He's hanging on the cross, the dying world that He saved, the people out there. And thank You that wherever we might be this tomorrow, the weeks that lie ahead, the days that lie ahead, let us live a living faith, a faith that points us to You, but a faith that reaches out to our people around us, a faith that says, yes, I am in God's family, a faith that says I can do all things through Christ, but a faith that also says, yes, I will feed you. Yes, I will give to you. Let me point you to the bread of life. Hallelujah. We receive that, Lord. We worship you. We adore you. We celebrate you. Amen, amen. Praise God, praise God. I want us to um, just focus on what the Lord has done for us. And uh, if you want to remain standing, that's good. We're going to read the word. I think it's good to stand in the presence of the Lord. In Isaiah 53, I want to read it out of the complete Jewish Bible. It might not have dawned on us, but Jesus was a Jew. And I just thought complete Jewish Bible kind of lends a little bit more authority, if you know what I'm saying. And verse 4, Isaiah 53 says, In fact, 
It was our diseases that he bore, our pains for which, from which he suffered. Say that Jesus bore my diseases, Jesus bore my diseases. And, he and he suffered with my pains. Yet we regarded him as punished, stricken, and afflicted by God. But he was wounded because of our crimes, crushed because of our sins. The disciplining that makes us whole fell on him, and by his bruises, by his wounds, we are healed. Say that by the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. Now that was prophesied centuries before Jesus actually walked the earth. And did he carry it out? Certainly we see that in Matthew chapter 8 from verse 1. A large crowds followed Jesus and he came down the mountainside, or as he came down, suddenly a man of le with leprosy approached him, knelt before him. Lord, the man said, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. And Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared. Say, so Jesus is willing. Jesus. He is the healer. He is the healer. In verse 14, we see that he goes to Peter's house, and Peter's mother-in-law is afflicted with a fever. Could have been COVID. I don't know, right? But she had a fever. And when Jesus touched her hand, the fever left her. Then, he got up and prepared, then she got up and prepared a meal for him. That evening, many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus, and he cast out the evil spirits with a simple command. And he healed all the sick. How many did Jesus heal? All. all the sick, right? This fulfilled the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah who said, He took our sicknesses and removed our diseases. God prophesied it. It has been fulfilled in Jesus. It's a done deal. Say that through Jesus Christ, through His wounds on the cross, I am healed. Amen? So those of you here this morning, if you have pain in your body, just raise your hand up. Say, Pastor, I've got pain in my body. I have, I've got pain. All right. Anyone else that says, I need prayer, I have an ailment, I have sickness or something, some form? Great. Well, come forward. Let us pray with you. I'm going to ask the leaders to come forward and we're going to minister to you. It's the same Jesus. Say that. The rest of you may be seated, but let's remain in this atmosphere of worship and adoration of our God. Say this with me. It's the same Jesus. Come on now. It's the same Jesus. He said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? Amen? Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. If you wouldn't mind just coming forward, put your feet against the platform. Thank you. Hallelujah. God is a good God. Amen? Amen? Who are the leaders that are, forward, that are going to be praying for people? Can I see who's coming to pray? I'm going to ask you maybe just to stand on the first step, if you don't mind. Let's just follow what the Lord is prompting us to do. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, pastors, leaders. Now, those of you who have come forward for prayer, please say the following with me. Say, when hands are laid on me, I receive the healing presence of God. For Jesus healed me. By His stripes, I have been healed. By His wounds, I have been made whole. I receive it now in Jesus' name. Okay, go ahead, pastors, leaders, pray for them. Lay hands on them. Thank you, Lord. Worship you. Let's stretch out our hands and believe with them. Let's pray with them. Praise God. Hallelujah. Give you your hands. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your healing presence in my brother. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. There it is. There it is. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Just relax. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your healing. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Say, thank you, Lord. I receive it now. In Jesus' name. Do you have pain in your body? feet thank you Lord for healing her feet now in the name of Jesus I'm going to touch your feet right? thank you Lord in Jesus name thank you for complete healing Father in the name of Jesus thank you Lord thank you Lord thank you for your presence perfectly made whole in Jesus name in 
Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Is there someone here that's trusting God for guidance, direction? You've got to make some decisions and you want us to agree with you. You have to make right choices in some way. Something significant is happening over the next few days. Just come to me over here, please, if you don't mind. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Just stand. There we go. You're selling your house? You don't know where you're going? There are a lot of RVs available in Texas. <laughs> okay. Mark, let me include you in this prayer, brother. Let's just hold hands. Hallelujah. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your presence upon them, for revealing your guidance, your direction, for what they need to do next, Father. You declare, Jesus, that my sheep hear my voice, and the voice of a stranger they will not follow. And we surrender to you every single decision is a decision we want that pleases you, your choice. And Father, I thank you for guiding Mark and Kathleen now in the sale of their home and where to move, what to do next. Thank you for clear direction in Jesus' name. And I boldly declare that they are filled to overflowing with the knowledge of your will, with all wisdom and spiritual understanding. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. It's done in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. you've taken that step is it a house you want is it a desire of your heart yes. you have peace in your heart yes. father i come in agreement with kathy now and i thank you for giving her the desire of her heart that home in jesus name thank you for a favorable god-guided outcome in jesus name amen praise god hallelujah hallelujah praise the lord praise the lord been prayed for? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your presence, Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. There we go. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, your presence is so wonderful, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. You love us so much, Holy Spirit. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for peace. Thank you for flooding us now, flooding them, filling them. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Is there anybody else that wants prayer for anything else? I just want us to pray this thing on my heart to pray for this tragedy that happened in Buffalo. We don't accept things like this in the United States. Amen. The works of the devil. I mean, I, as the church grows brighter, so the devil's kingdom gets frantic and he tries to do all sorts of strange things. But if you're not sure, there was a shooting and about 10 people dead, I think. And so, But Father, we lift up those families in Buffalo. That tragedy. And Holy Spirit, we're not sure what way, but we just know that there are hurts, people crying and pain. Thank you for touching them now, being with them. Time does not heal. You are the healer. And thank you for your presence with them now, no matter who they are, what they are, who they believe, what they believe. Thank you for wrapping your arms around them. You love every single human being beyond measure. Thank you, Lord, for providing for them, supporting them now in Jesus' name. Amen.